Hey everyone! Welcome back to another episode of Adobo and Avocados. My name is Marie, and today, you know, I have um, our usual, uh, my my usual partner um, in crime, <laughs> Nicole Vanderhoof. Ooh, I That's, like that. I like being so, your partner yeah. in crime. <laughs> what crime are we committing? Uh, I don't know a lot. <laughs> Um, I'll also today, introduce yeah. our next yeah. guest over there because Marie yeah. asked me to earlier. Um, please welcome Mara Puhayeri, if I pronounce that correctly. <laughs> Thank you so you much for so coming good. on with us. <laughs> yeah, so the reason um, I've asked Nicole is so five minutes before doing this, well, not five minutes, but because we joined like um, a while ago, but five minutes before that, I was practicing how to pronounce uh, Marit's last name, and I think I failed. Um, so I've asked Nicole, you know, kindly if she can do it. <laughs> so thank you. Um, so today, yeah, we've got, you know, Marit as a like, very special guest. Uh, if you're, you know, in the testing community, if you've attended, you know, past meetups, conferences, or if you've ever, you know, read a resource about exploratory testing, um, you know, Marit is such a household name. Um, I remember when I was um, initially, you know, starting off uh, Twitter, like you were the first few people that I followed and you got a lot of resources around exploratory testing specifically that was really useful um but before we get into all that like the public speaking and you know your uh views around you know your approach on like um the um the uh, testing itself um it would be great if you could do a quick intro um you know about you know yourself so who is marit <laughs> i wish i knew i, I was just <laughs> thinking that I, I read these self-help books to understand who am I. But there's few things that I have learned over the years, which is uh, I've been around for 26 years in these professional circles. So I, I, uh, I was uh, celebrating my 25th silver jubilee last autumn at this time. So it now must be 26 years of, of, of working with this one. And I kind of started uh, doing this testing thing and anything related to programming kind of by accident. Mm -hmm. So uh, in high school, when uh, I, I decided what I will be when I grow up, I thought I knew I, I was going to be a chemical engineer. I was certain of that. So chemistry was my, my one big love back in those days. Yeah. Uh, but I also learned that I'm allergic and I had doctors telling me that uh, my love will kill me and oh, I no. should you know, reconsider. Uh, and I was like, nope, I will not. I, I went to study chemistry. And then I saw my friends suffer from the, the organic chemistry labs who didn't have any any kind of otherwise limitations. And I started to believe the doctor. So I had a bit of a career crisis in a way. Uh, I ended up in computer science uh, because I was reading about um, uh, uh, low level programming, kind of the, the assembler yeah, stuff, assembler uh, related things. And I thought that, you know, if I can pass that course in a university, like I can write code in assembler, then, you know, I can go through the rest of the studies as well. So that's how I ended up in computer science. Assembler was, was my, my uh, next thing that uh, kind of like got me after uh, chemistry. Mm -hmm. But then testing, uh, I didn't know it even existed, but I got directly recruited out of, of the computer science studies to test Greek uh, uh, Microsoft, Microsoft Office back in the days. I don't still know why it was done in Finland, but for some reason it was. So localization testing of a Greek version of Microsoft Office was my first testing assignment. And that was because I've always been into languages, but apparently only <laughs> Finnish like languages because <laughs> I couldn't make sense of Nicole's last name. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, Marit, we, we have to talk about that. Yeah. I really love languages too. <laughs> But yeah, I fell into testing. It's kind of like falling in love. And, and yeah. you know, I've been on that journey since. It's like chemistry was your first love. And then assembly. And then, assembler, and then the assembler is your second love. And then your final love. <laughs> like your one true you know, love is testing. I think... I think there's a theme here, though, and maybe as a language person, you'll understand it, too. I feel like I talk about this, but people don't quite get it. Um, I feel like there's a lot of overlap 
there because like chemistry is a lot about building blocks you know it's about putting things together and structures and languages are like that too um there are there are different language families but they all have syntax they all have vocabulary you know we do as humans still seek to communicate in fundamentally the same ways it's just a matter of figuring out like exactly what structure you're using and once you have a structure you can start building lots of different things with it and i think there's very much an overlap between human languages and computer languages too just computer languages are you know lacking nuance maybe or or like are are a lot more regular <laughs> cuz human languages aren't but but i think all of those things are connected but also the connecting uh, stream might also be learning. One of the things that I have kind of like, you know, I find that maybe connects all of the things that I have done over the years is this this love for learning and, and kind of like always striving to know something new or figure out something new. And I have really liked this, this kind of like a framing of like you go to your work and, and like the whole exploratory testing stuff, like that's all about learning, like the central uh, aspect of that is learning. So kind of like you are whatever you are with your current level of skills, but you go in with the attitude that you can learn something new today. And, and that makes you a little bit better today. And if you would happen to be, you know, very good at, at, at kind of targeting your learning, if you could find that 1% better, it makes you like so much better than your past self. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm very much against competition between people. I'm, I'm very much a collaboration person, but kind of like, you know, competing with my past self that no longer exists and, and kind of like enjoying the challenge of, of seeing, uh, you know, some skills go away, kind of like this atrophy, but there's you know, like new, th new things that make you excited and, and, and give you the big positive feels. I think that's something that really has been driving my, my years in, in tech. I love that. So I, I think, yeah. Um, it just, uh, sorry. Uh, it just reminded me of the compound effect uh, book that I read. Um, and you specifically like nailed it. Like, you only need to try and be better 1% at the time. There's no point, you know, trying to rush everything because you might not see the effects now. But if you compound it, you know, like similar thing with like investment, like stocks, you see the effect like after like five to 10 years. Um, and it's really beautiful that, you know, we can also link that back to learning, self-improvement and not trying to compete with other people but you know competing with your past self i think that's 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 a really beautiful yeah thought i was gonna say that i have hung out a lot in like polyglot circles and there is a very famous hyper polyglot modern hyper polyglot richard simcott and i met him in one of the polyglot gatherings and um so i i actually have my my name tag here there's like this a conference where you have your your languages in flags. Richards was like entirely filled. Wow. I mean, the guy's brilliant, you know. Yeah. And um, the interesting thing is when you talk to hyper polyglots like that, people who, you know, you're not talking about four languages that they speak fluently. You're talking about like 20 that they speak to a professional level. And when you talk to them, um, there's this idea of like, because you always want to ask them, how did you learn those languages? And their answer is, you learn one and then add another. And there's actually a whole movement around this add one, because, you know, really, you don't think of learning 20, you learn mm -hmm. about just n plus one, where n is what you already know, and you're just adding one. Um, and I think that if when you think about learning in that way, it's a lot less daunting because it's just one little step above. If you then went on, like, for example, instead of just learning React, if you were like, well, I just want to learn every computer programming language, the language that exists and be able to do everything in all of them. That's like, OK, <laughs> that's a very big undertaking. But having that one incremental step that's very specific can really do wonders. Yeah, that's definitely it. I've been uh, using the word polyglot programmer 
uh, describing mm -hmm. myself. Yeah. Not necessarily because I'm uh, kind of like, I, I, I don't consider myself as like a hyper language oriented in, in that sense. But it's more kind of like you can also learn uh, accidentally. And, and, you know, there's different levels of how well do you need to know before you can dare to say that you know something. So again, having done projects in particular languages, surviving with Googling around them, uh, I've collected quite a number of, of languages as a tester over the years, traveling between various projects. So again, uh, testing usually doesn't start with the, the programming language that we are creating in. It usually starts in the, the user's domain, but you very quickly drill into the, the, uh, the local implementation stuff as well uh, in order to get the information flows uh, uh, well in, in the team. So I've been really collecting languages over the years, and I think I'm at 16 right now on the programming languages. Yeah. And I don't count the funny languages, which I have already also uh, spent time on in, in conference uh, circles. Like there's a, did you know there's a programming language called Rockstar, where you're actually writing awesome. your program code in, in 80s rock uh, lyrics? Oh, wow. It's That's so cool. Fun, uh, sessions in conferences. But uh, oh. I would hope we don't end up using it in the, in the real circles. <laughs> so yeah. I, I think it came about as a, as a joke around this idea that, you know, everyone was looking at some point for rock star programmers. So mm. now it actually means something really specific. Oh, there is a language cool. called rock star. Yeah. That's the beauty of it. Like, you don't have to like learn a programming language just because you have to apply it like professionally like it could also be you know just for fun just you know if you want to like try out like different things and at the end of it like you still get that outcome of your being one one percent better because you know after learning that then you know you can share to others you can you know say to other people that hey this there's this awesome language called rockstar um and that's like a conversation you know like like starter already so it's that's really good i haven't i haven't heard that so i'll definitely be googling about rockstar programming language afterwards marit i have to ask um do you have a note-taking system for mm -hmm. learning uh i have a rule uh, that i learned from one of my managers back in the days that uh there are things that time takes care of and then there's things that it's time to take care of. So I don't want to actually write down all of my things in a note-taking system because uh, committing time to writing notes in a particular way, it's a big time, time investment. And there's this, this whole principle of opportunity cost that you need to be aware of, you know, time on something is time away from something else. But also reading that stuff is, is quite a, a heavy, heavy thing. So I have a system on the time when I'm testing, kind of like when I'm learning a new uh, system and, and this well exploring it i have a system for that specifically which is more reliant on on a a paper and a way of of kind of like just tracking how uh, my perspectives move over time so i don't mm -hmm. uh, leave that behind it's kind of like something to throw away afterwards but i can also use those notes uh notes as a way of scaring off anyone who thinks I'm not, I don't know what I'm doing because I do know quite well what I'm doing, but as in kind of like a system where I could always go back to all of my notes, I, I have decided that it's better to forget some of the things that I usually would take notes of. So I'm, I'm very paper oriented and throwing away oriented nowadays. But yeah, this is, this is more pretty in Finnish because, you know, this, the same expression, aika hoita, time takes care of. Aika it is time to take care of something. So it's exactly the same thing. There's a small difference in, in how you would kind of like, you know, use your voice and, and you know, out of the context, you, you're getting the impression of, you know, like either it, you do nothing and it goes away or you actually now do something to make it go away or kind of like deal with it. So um, that's been my main kind of guideline in, in all of the note taking. I really love that you said you've decided it's okay to forget. Mm. I felt a little called out because <laughs> <laughs> because I am a person that like I I'm very verbal. And so for me writing is learning. And if I haven't written something down in some way, 
then I don't feel like I've actually understood it. It's like explaining things in my own words and also being able to look back on it afterwards. But you're totally right that it is an opportunity cost. There are things I will never get to learn because I've decided to encodify some of my learnings instead. Um, that's something that you each person has to decide for themselves. But mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I could do that. I could give myself permission to forget a little bit more or, often. Uh, maybe I haven't actually. Now you, I feel called out. Permission, because what I do is I use Mastodon now that I no longer am on Twitter. Oh, I use oh yes, a, uh, me too. Like, no taking tool. So kind of like I write it down so, you know, like, so that I can forget it. I can let it go. It's kind of like a, it's a ritual for me of letting mm -hmm. go of an idea. But at the same time, it also creates the opportunity for other people to take that idea and build on it if they want yeah. to. So it's more like broadcasting my ideas to the world. And I did do extensive blogging earlier uh, for the exact same reason. But uh, with blogging, it is even more of the kind of like uh, when I want to really solidify some learning, I will write a blog post about it. It's not for you. It's not for the others. It's not for the audience. It's actually for me. And, and that kind of like uh, uh, selfishness, selfishness in a way in, in doing some public facing activities has been something that I have needed to learn over the years. Because then when I start thinking about the audience, like the, the, the bar is so much higher, like, well, I'm already bad for myself. Like I, I'm, I'm really critical, but when I start thinking too much about the audience, rather than discovering what the audience likes, uh, uh, I would never publish anything anymore. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the stuff is about kind of like, you know, allowing me the quirks that I have and, and doing the best I can with them and actually doing more than, than I could before by, you know, forgiving myself for certain, certain things that I thought that everyone needs to be doing. Yeah. So maybe now's the perfect time to delve into the whole public speaking, um, you know, side. And um, you've mentioned, for example, that um, when you write about things that you know you want others to build on, um, are I'm curious if there have been, you know, um, times when you've written something and then someone has collaborated with you and turned that into I don't know a speaking like uh, like a talk or like something else. Um, so yeah, maybe now it's the right time to talk all about public speaking. Uh, for my process, uh, a lot of the, the thinking happens before going on a stage for public speaking scenarios. And this is probably because my history with public speaking is, again, you know, I, I actually, that's one thing that I did not fall in love with originally. Like, that was a handicap in a way for me. Um, I had a huge fear of public speaking mm -hmm. about 20 years ago still, 22 years ago maybe. So I remember going to this job interview at the university circles where I was a student active and I wanted to get this particular student union uh, paid job that existed. And as part of the, the job interview, I needed to introduce myself to them, you know, the student body, you know, about 30 people in the room. It's not like everyone was there. It was kind of a smaller, smallish group. And um, I could barely stand on my two feet. Uh, I was shaking so much that uh, I, I felt physically sick and I didn't do a good job introducing myself. I couldn't, you know, do anything uh, other than, than just kind of like collapse out of the, the, the stage. And uh, as an experience, it was something that I felt like uh, I don't think I can do the things in life that I, I aspire to if, if I can't speak to people. So uh, instead of, of uh, accepting that, I started figuring out how to work with that. And I then uh, found a job at the university as a researcher and teacher. And university students, poor people, <laughs> I should say this, I don't know if I should say it, but I will say it anyway. Um, uh, you know, the teachers can make a choice of whether that's compulsory or not. And me and the professor, we made a decision that it's compulsory to take part in my lectures back in the <laughs> days when I was super afraid of public speaking. So, so they had to be there, but also they uh, wanted to be there to learn the topics. 
and uh, the topic that I was teaching on was testing, which was something that I cared for. So kind of like, you know, combining the home ground and the, the fear and a, a little bit safer environment, I started practicing. And when I uh, then managed to learn some of the basic skills, uh, I started doing it in more public settings, kind of like in conferences, first in Finland. I think uh, my first 300 talks I delivered in Finland. So I really took practice very seriously. Uh, uh, around 400 talks, I remember reading this article somewhere online where someone said that there are no women uh, worth merit or women of merit in keynoting circles. And uh, that turned my spy-driven development a uh, uh, bit on. Like, well, 400 talks delivered and not merit? Like, what is this? And then I realized that, of course, for the English-speaking world, the Finnish-speaking world doesn't exist. So then I kind of flipped the the practice into uh, international areas. And I'm at 537 talks right now. Uh, and officially, I just said I retired now. So I hope that that's the number that I will stay with at for quite some time. But yeah, public speaking, it's a, it's a learning thing as well for me. Hmm. There's a lot to unpack there because I think like Nicole, uh, we've mentioned this on like previous episode because we both um, obviously felt that like there's not a lot of representation of, you know, women from like our background, like Southeast Asian women, um, like immigrants, you know, like in Europe. And having like heard your, you know, your story, um, it sort of like validates that as well because um, to me, it sounds like you've also felt that there's not a lot of women representation out there, uh, you know, in a lot of like, you know, tech conferences. Um, and I know that the title of our um, stream is The Benefits and Dangers of Public Speaking. Um, did you ever felt that it was getting too much in terms of, you know, people's expectations? Because, like, let's be real, um, public speaking is very tiring it consumes a lot of you know our energy um so have you ever felt you know at times where you want to quit at times where you're like oh my god there's another talk i have to do it but you don't feel like doing it <laughs> there's been many moments like that and, and now that i've been analyzing back my my things that i wrote in twitter apparently more than i remembered <laughs> i've been feeling like i should quit this earlier as well um uh, there was a lot that I first got out of public speaking, which was basically kind of, you know, getting over my fear. Uh, I have um, another kind of like an anxiety related symptom almost where uh, people, when they talk to me, I'm happy to talk back. But if I would have to approach a stranger and even in a conference that is, you know, a testing conference, and I can assume everyone wants to talk about testing um, having to go and speak to them without them first saying that they want to speak to me, uh, it's something that is really difficult for me. It has always been. So going on a stage was kind of like an open greeting card saying kind of like, you know, talk to me about this stuff. Like, you know, I'm broadcasting this stuff. I love to talk about this. Talk to me at any time. And uh, for the first years of public speaking, that's really what it did to me. Like it was giving me so much. I found great people who were excited about the same things as I was. We would pair up, we would talk, we would, you know, co-create something. I would learn so much. I wouldn't know, you know, half of the things I know today. I wouldn't know if I didn't meet those people. And, and kind of going on that stage and, and even finding that single person, it was always worthwhile. But then at some point, uh, especially going into the keynoting circles, uh, it flipped a little bit. I became intimidating to people. Like uh, uh, everyone approaching me nowadays, they come to me as in, like, Marit, you are so busy. You are so important. I'm like, no, I'm not that busy. And I'm definitely not that important. Like I'm still, you know, the same person. I'm still keen on learning. I'm still looking for my people everywhere. Uh, but but now they approach me with, you know, an apology, kind of like, you know, since you get to talk to these, you know, 2000 people at a time, you must be important and, and you must be too important to me. 
like there's this apology that that is nowadays built into into public speaking but also there's the other side where um, uh, the people who are not apologetic uh, might even be hostile so uh, the uh, decision of quitting public speaking for me it uh, came from uh, one kind of like an individual incident in a way where someone gave me a very negative, kind of like overwhelming negative feedback. And, and since I was already kind of questioning whether this is, you know, good use of my time, uh, getting a feedback which was basically telling me that the keynote that I delivered was bad, you know, that I'm okay with that feedback. You know, saying that I did bad, is, is, it's not a, you know, it's, it's an okay thing. But then uh, that person continued the feedback saying, all of my talks always are bad. So, you know, like as if they have sampled 537 of my talks and know that they are all always bad. And uh, then and then kind of proceeding into going into the judgment of I should never be allowed on the stage again. And I was like, well, I didn't want to be here anyway. So maybe, you know, one person out of these thousands here in the room I'm going to, you know, uh, not really listen to you, but I'm going to use you as a teaching mechanism and an excuse of doing something that I wanted. Like, I'm not actually getting paid so much for this, this speaking work. I have other work that pays my salary. So maybe, you know, like, if this is the reward that someone in the audience is going to give me, maybe it's fair for me to say that, bye-bye, you can be on this stage and you have one less person worth merit on, on that, that stage after. So again, you know, like it's, it's more from the positive things, kind of like making space for other things in life. But the final straw was really this one person. And, you know, I can say always, you know, like, like I, I actually know who the person is now because that person in the audience happened to be huffing and puffing, you know, angry, physically angry, uh, watching me on a stage, I don't understand why that would be, and happened to have a Finnish woman standing behind them, reading them over their shoulder because they were visibly angry. Normally people don't read what you're writing on your mobile phone. But this yeah. particular feedback, the community brought it back to me and told me who the person is. And to some degree, I am even more upset that I know that it wasn't a woman I know that it wasn't from Finland. These were important things to me to know. But knowing that it was another speaker in the same conference where I was keynoting, do not do this to other people. So to some yeah. degree, it makes me more upset. But also it is comforting to know that it was an individual and it doesn't define us all. But it is also a good story to remember that this is not how we behave when yeah. we give Back. Testing in particular is about giving feedback. We should know how to give that feedback in a kind and 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 uh, non uh, well, you know, in a way where uh, it is more likely to be a positive force rather than than something that destroys the person. That's so hard to hear because I, I also think that when somebody, the way that I think of it is that if somebody has put themselves out there to speak in public, I think you should actually be kinder to them than you would yeah. to somebody that you're just speaking to one on one. Um, because it is really, it makes you really vulnerable to speak in public like that. And any forum, whether that's in a conference or, or like on YouTube, like what we're doing now. And I think it's also partly the anonymity. Um, I think people hide behind that, even though in this case, you found out afterwards who it was, there is still that shield like, oh, I can say anything that I want. I don't have to be human or a nice person, because they don't know who I am. And that's just, you know, it comes down to who you really are as a person. And I think that one of the main dangers of speaking in public in any forum is that there is this, this familiarity, this parasocial relationship that develops where people feel they know you, but you don't actually know them and there's actually no personal relationship. 
you know, maybe if you had a personal relationship, you know, maybe you could conceivably have a friend that just gives you like really, really um, strong feedback, but there should be an undercurrent and un a foundation of trust and care. But when you don't have that care, then you're just being aggressive for no, for what reason? You're just trying to put people down. And that's this whole parasocial thing coming into play where that person felt like, you know, that that, that was okay to do to you. And there's nothing coming back to them. There's actually, there was no way for you to respond uh, as far as they knew, you know. That's just really disappointing. And it's something that you definitely have to have to think about when you go into public speaking like that, those sort of things are going to happen. Yeah. And again, it's, it's not like this person somehow like destroyed me completely by this one feedback. So it's just, uh, it felt like it was a good teaching point at, at that time when I already wanted to kind of like, you know, look for spending my, my time and energies elsewhere. And over the years uh, having uh, well, uh, quest uh, statements framed as questions. That's my favorite way of, of doing things in, in a public speaking scenario, kind of like, uh, no, you don't do that. Uh, you should, you know, if you have a questions uh, thing, you, you will ask a question instead of deliver a secondary talk after you're the speaker. That's another one that you have to deal with a lot. Like you learn, you know, to deal with these. And you learn to deal with even worse uh, stuff. So I also, well, there's this uh, earlier incident eight years ago, uh, where I was doing one of my first keynotes uh, in uh, New York, and the other keynoter decided to spend half of their keynote talking about me. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, there's power uh, towards the speaker from the audience, kind of through the anonymity, but there's even more power from that stage. And, and there's been both kind of like, you know, positive experiences that I have had of that power, being able to impact the, the, the learning and, and the, the things that are going on in, in the industry from that stage, but also uh, having been attacked from that stage is an experience that I unfortunately uh, carry. And uh, last Friday, I had, a, a, again, kind of like a remembering that time, unfortunately, uh, and uh, it felt really awful to realize that eight years later, I have one single article that I have written that is more popular in hits than uh, me recounting the man attacking me from the stage. So my professional career will always be tainted by the fact that a guy, without my permission, decided that he's going to speak about me on a stage. I'm... That's it. It feels you know. It, that's how it it is sometimes, but uh, it is not the normal. So again, like I know that today we we decided that we're gonna address some of the most difficult parts of public speaking. I have done three hundred, well, five hundred thirty-seven because I actually got a lot out of that, but I also got a few experiences that are not easy to deal with. And as you can still see, like they still make me emotional thinking about them after the fact. I mean, I, I think yeah. that it, it's unrealistic to expect that you would feel no emotion. We're, we're humans, you know, yeah. just because we're on the stage doesn't make us less human. Does it make us, you know, tougher in some way or, or less affected by feedback? And, and sometimes even if that feedback is is completely negative, um, you know, people, I think, don't understand that it's actually the negative things that stick in your head, you, you yeah. know, you might have 99 five star reviews, or, or like really positive comments, you will remember the one that was just awful. And you will remember that, you know, for for years afterwards, at least in my case. Yeah. The conferences, the organizers, they can also do a lot, you know, to moderate yeah. this feedback, to enable a more positive 
tone of the feedback. So first of all, I think the conference where I got this particular negative feedback, they should have filtered that and to say that there was one thing that they considered abusive and, and they should have taken it out. That's my, my perspective. That's what I would do if, when I'm organizing conferences. Yeah. I would let them know that there was something that was like that, but that I, it's it's being filtered out. Like, again, you know, like, I don't think people need to hear this. This is, it's it's not beneficial to anyone, the unfiltered feedback. And the other thing they can do is they can design their conferences so that the feedback is less anonymous. Like, they can actually, uh, you know, facilitate conversations with the, the speakers on kind of mm -hmm. like, you know, uh, encourage conversations, even if they're, you know, challenging conversations, you know, after they, the, the, the talk or uh, they could uh, assign a body uh, who is you know capable of being that you know you talked about the more close person who is you know you will want the feedback even if it's harsh and, and negative and and you will try to turn it into a positive force so they can name you that body that person who is who is doing that service for you so there's a lot of ways of, of doing this better uh, and I feel like uh, to some degree conferences have this one pattern that they're applying always and it leaves then, uh, well, the speakers and the community of speakers in particular uh, to deal with the, the negative aspects. And I don't believe we should be, you know, tougher, like, you know, that it comes as part of this job. Because we are the audience, we, you know, similar people than the speakers are also in that audience. And we can choose how to be kind to the person on that stage. So I, I will not ever be ready to accept that that's just how it is and, and it belongs to this stage. It's a world we need to change. And I guess that's why we're having this conversation to some degree. Yeah. One one thing that I would like to ask, um, and I know, like you know, for this um specific conference, like I'm, I'm sure, like you know, it it could have been handled better. But I think it also highlights, you know, the importance of, you know, the code of conducts, like during conferences, like you know, because like you said, we're just all humans. We are making ourselves vulnerable by being on stage, speaking to a lot of, you know, strangers that we don't know. And I think there's a lot of things there that, you know, conference organizers can, like, really, you know, put some effort in. I think, you know, having clear code of conducts, um, you know, that's, that's one thing. Because um, at least that's because it's just, like, a very human sort of, like, common sense <laughs> like a common decency it's just you know we just need to be nice we just need to show empathy you know to other people and especially if there are new faces like new voices as well in conference um and you know that's not really gonna be a positive experience you know for them as well so organizers they they have a lot of um opportunities here to improve as well yeah, I took a hint uh, from PyCon this year, PyCon Europe, I think it actually was. Uh, they started their openings uh, thing by, by telling people how to be a good audience member. So they taught from stage uh, to everyone before the, the talk started on, on how to ask questions, not make statements. And uh, I uh, did kind of like elaborate this as a proposal for the conference where I got my negative feedback for next year, that especially since it is a testing conference for, where feedback is the skill that they come there to learn, maybe they could use, you know, the opening starting points of, of, of that conference to teach people how to deliver that feedback and to remind them that all of the interactions that we have also in conferences are actually, you know, giving that feedback to others. And yes, it does tell more about us, the feedback that we give this, this in this anonymous format. It tells more about us as, as, you know, what do I want and what do I kind of like do than the, the person on the stage. But uh, it also could uh, maybe frame that in a way where we would try to make our feedback more helpful rather than, well, uh, managing the emotion, which was clearly anger in this, this particular case case that uh, you know when you're able to uh, shout your bad feeling to someone else then then you know it feels somehow lighter on you but um, it really well receiving hate, hate mail uh, as a comment wasn't uh, the thing that I signed up for
No, no one should be, uh, you know, experiencing that. And I am genuinely, you know, like disappointed that that has happened to you because you have contributed a lot to the community. And just, you know, even though it's just, you know, like one or two experience, like Nico said, it's like sometimes it's the negative experiences that, you know, really stick with us. Um, and yeah, I, I, I'm just lost like for words. A while ago, I was getting a bit, um, like theory eye because I've experienced like a similar um, you know experience but not to the extent that you have um, like shared with us so I can just imagine you know the emotional like trauma that you know you've experienced and nobody should ever be in that position do you want to tell us about mm-hmm. it if you know if you want to Maria? Uh- yeah, um, this was when I um, first joined as a Cyprus ambassador. Um, you know, Cyprus was a tool oh, that I was this. using professionally. And I've, you know, applied to become an ambassador because, you know, I've, I think for me, like representation matters. Um, when I started posting a lot about it, you know, I've been getting trolls. Um, and someone even made a meme <laughs> out of it, like... Oh, we're going to a conference. Oh, let's better go. Marie will talk about Cyprus. Lisa Crispin will talk about this. And it's just like, you know, it's not really needed. And I have one talk around accessibility as well. And this person just decided to attack me on LinkedIn saying that you can't talk about accessibility because Cyprus cannot cover accessibility stuff. But then my whole talk wasn't even about <laughs> Cyprus. They just assume that, you know, because I'm a Cyprus ambassador, I'm paid to do all these things. <laughs> I am not paid at all. Like this was like a free, you know, gig. Like I was just um, like helping the community. And the talk that I did, it was around accessibility testing. And so this person just decided to attack me for, you know, no reason. Um, people from the community have, you know, like defended, like have said things, you know, that are really helpful, like to me in a way. But that was what, three, four years ago. And up to this date, it still like sticks out to me that it has happened. Yeah. Yeah. And my experience eight years ago, like it was a single incident, one single time. And it still keeps coming back to me. Like, okay, fine. The guy lost a lot of business for attacking one of his own. He has attacked other people. He finds yeah. new targets continuously. And I keep having these conversations about, like, are we supporting, you know, like, can we separate the contents and the person and and all of that? Like, like there's so much educational stuff that still needs to go on about how people feel about these kind of things. And again, you being a Cyprus ambassador and doing a talk on another thing, uh, I can definitely see uh, similar experiences on my social media side side of things. That people think that you kind of like you have one label in your forehead, yeah. and that somehow defines you. Like now, it's testing or it's Cyprus or like for me right now, it's Selenium, which is kind of funny because I'm a playwright girl. Like I use playwrights. <laughs> <laughs> I don't thinking care what the tool is, but yeah. I do care about the Selenium community a lot. And I think it's amazing what Selenium has done. 19 years of existence and, and you know, uh, inspiration to all the other competing tools uh, mm-hmm. by being around and, and, and doing the work for that long. I think it's just inspirational. But, but again, I had the label of, you know, like it, it writes. Uh, in, in your forehead and and we can you know we can choose as you know people we can choose to uh versatile the make it more versatile the labels that we we assign to people and for some reason uh well i think all three of us usually get introduced as women first not as whatever professionals we are first and i'm i'm pretty sure the 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 language area or the ethnicity is also kind of defining 
in, in a lot of the labels that people are using. And there's a really great 15 minute keynote from a, I think it was a 14 year old girl or 15 year old girl. She talks about kind of the labels that were already assigned to her because she liked, you know, certain geeky things, but she also liked other things. So, so it's a really lovely, lovely keynote from one of the Oscons. So, so look for, for a, a label related Oscon keynote from a very young uh, uh, girl presenter. So I also wanted to talk about some things that maybe might help. I'm struck by the parallels between, you know, speaking on a, on a stage, which I have done, though, obviously not to the degree that you have, Marit. But um, for me, most of my speaking is actually on YouTube in the form of live streams and videos. And there are some things that I've had to do to set up these boundaries to protect myself from these things. And we need to make a separation between, you know, victim blaming and also just protecting yourself. I'm not saying it's my fault for for doing whatever I'm doing. Um, and, you know, like it's not it's not anything that I do that makes um, other people have to attack me or, or anything like that. However, I think it is also healthy as some sort of a public figure, as someone who speaks in public, to think about what boundaries you can set. So one of the things that I do is I have an ethic statement. And in that ethic statement, I clearly spell out what I, how I see, I like how I see the service that I'm providing, what things I will speak about, what kinds of sponsorships I'm going to take, when money changes hands that I'm going to actually um, directly, ex you know, tell people that that there is some bias. But also, I set out very clearly what my expectations are. For example, in my public spaces, in my on my YouTube channel, that is mine. So mm -hmm. you don't go into my house and then expect to be able to shoot off your mouth. I don't think it's a democracy, you know, when it is something that I have control over, I am going to delete comments that are abusive, not ones that disagree. Disagreement is fine if you're civil about it. And I spell that out, like no homophobia or, or any sort of discrimination. Those things I say, I'm just going to delete your comment and probably ban you. And I may not warn you because it's my space. It's not a public space. So I have communities as well where I get to decide on the code of conduct. And, you know, I, I wavered on this because I was like, well, I kind of want it to be a communal area. But you know what? Everywhere else is, is a communal public area where people could do whatever they want. This is my space. And in, in those spaces, I think I have the right to decide what goes. And also one of the reasons why I do like being on YouTube is that I can set filters for certain words that I know would trigger me. So mm -hmm. I don't even see those comments. They just disappear and I never have to think about it. And, you know, they're not even just negative comments. Sometimes they're positive comments. I'm uncomfortable, for example, as a woman in tech, I do not like getting comments about physical appearance, good or bad, because I've gotten both, when I'm talking about something that I'm passionate about that's not related to appearance at all, like focus on the things that I'm saying, you know, focus on on the words and, and not really how I'm delivering it or whatever. And I really like that on YouTube, I just don't see that. And I wish that that occurred in in actual in-person conferences as well, because yeah. it's just a load off of my mind, you know, to, to know that all the comments that are there, if I choose to look at them, are going to be either positive or like disagreeing with me in a respectful way. That's actually a really good framing for, for how to, to deal with that and kind of like treating it as your space and, and your right to set the boundaries. It's it's been totally helpful for me in social media. Like, well, I I mute a lot of words like preemptively so that I never see them. So there are certain conversations that you can't start with me in those spaces. So it's it's a, a really good practice to have. This 
Well, this yeah, is also why I love Mastodon. You said that you do too. I own and manage my own Mastodon server for this reason, because I want to be able to control who gets to participate in that community, you know, yeah. and I, I have had to ban people. And it wasn't because their views differed from mine. It was because the way that they expressed those views was really aggressive in a way that I didn't appreciate. Um, I was reading your um, website um, before, Marit, and I think um, one of the things that you are very explicit about is this pay-to-speak um, that, you know, you're not going to pay if, like, they're not going to, you know, pay for your travel. Um, and I remember seeing, like, a spreadsheet somewhere as well that I think you have maintained. I think Richard Bradshaw um, shared this on Twitter, well, X um, ages ago, because um, he also has, uh, he also, I think he has like a speaker rider page that, you know, this is what he's gonna, um, you know, be expected with, like this are like, you know, what his expectations are. So I think to me, that's also one form of setting, you know, your boundaries. Mm, that's good. Um, so maybe like you could talk a bit more about, you know, this whole pay to speak uh, movement, like your views around it. And because I think there's that barrier as well for people who are underrepresented to speak at conferences, but then they are expected to cover, you know, for the travel expenses and everything. Yeah. Over the years, I have uh, only once had to cancel my going to a conference after I promised to go. And it was for a very lovely conference last autumn called Socrates in Germany. Uh, they uh, paid for my travel. Uh, they would have paid one night in a hotel, but not enough nights for the entire duration of the conference. Uh, they were willing to even grow that kind of like, you know, to give me a little bit more benefits. I, I was having a financially very tough time. Uh, at that point so they were willing to kind of leave and extend it but uh, just being away from home and having to organize uh, stuff with kids while being away was yeah. too much of an expense that I could not expect to get all of that so I have you know I've, I've gone through this personally of having to uh, not be somewhere or having to give up something on my family and kids for for actually showing up even when they pay uh, the travel expenses. So when the conferences don't pay the travel expenses, you're expected to have an employer who supports you. Not everyone, actually majority of us don't have one of those. And uh, you're expected to somehow kind of like see it as an investment into visibility. And mm. a lot of us can't actually afford that. It's not a possibility for us and it just adds to the bias of what the representation looks like then like it is more sales oriented it is often more travel uh, uh, easy travel already kind of uh, the ge uh, geographies that are represented or the, the, the demographies that are represented are people who are already traveling for work so it's often uh, more salesy um, usually it's uh, less women in particular and it is the richer countries, let's say it that way, uh, that is, is heavily represented in the in the speaking circles. So this whole uh, pay to speak movement was to just raise awareness on the idea that that it is actually a blocker for you know good experiences to learn from to be out there that we have to pay for that speaking opportunity some people it's just the travel sometimes you actually have to pay for even you know entry to the conference there's that kind of conferences as well and then there's even conferences where the whole um, kind of like getting a stage spot is a sponsored position so you have to be a, your company's representative and the company money that is paid is, is quite relevant so the pay to speak stuff you know, it was always important to me. I wanted to figure out if it's possible to do a, a non-profit conference that actually pays fairly for the speakers. And, uh, well, that resulted in a, a bit of a personal temporary bankruptcy for me in, in uh, running that uh, and then getting oh, Corona wow. in, uh, on top of it. So, yeah, definitely not the, the most positive experience uh, to discuss on. But uh, I wanted to figure out if we can have uh, so high... Uh, uh, value of the conference contents that people are willing to pay a real fee 
so that uh, you can pay the speakers also for the work they're doing, not just that the travel, but that you could uh, kind of like share the risk by guaranteeing the travel and then only sharing profits. Uh, I did learn in that process that uh, organizing a conference is a lot more work than speaking. And organizing a conference includes the risk like Corona. Mm-hmm. Uh, and speaking doesn't include a risk like Corona. Like it's that that risk is on 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 the on the conference organizer. So that's why the conference organizer actually should be paid quite a relevant amount of money because the financial risks that they carry are, are quite relevant if it's a physical conference. But the pay to speak stuff, uh, the idea that we would at least uh, make enough money to not make people to pay their own travel, that is still very important to me. And paytospeak.org is nowadays a, a website that I host where that Excel is actually linked to. There's nothing else on, on that website. Uh, I have too many projects where I, I, I just get the, the website and I have an idea of creating something more out <laughs> yes. of it. But uh, this is, it's still just the Excel to give people an idea of, of how many different ways of organizing for this there are. Yeah, I've added the link here because, yeah, if, because uh, it's a very comprehensive um, Google Sheet, um, I must say, uh, it lists all the you know big conference like small conference and then you've got like all the different information there so yep i think it would be useful uh, if we if we share it as well yeah but also like uh, obviously that changes every year kind of like what the conferences are offering like sometimes you know there have been conferences that don't pay the travel and now they're paying the travel because it's starting to be the way of the world that that the travel is paid yeah. Uh, then there's conferences that are actually actively only looking for local speakers so that they can pay the travel because the travel is zero. Yeah. Uh, so again, they're not really looking for international speakers, even though they appear to have an open call for proposals, they are not actively trying to look for that necessarily. Like they are looking for their local community. So we could do better in communicating that. But also like the, the benefits, like one of the, the ones that I used to consider uh, not so well behaving in this pay to speak space, which was Eurostar, which is one of the big ones in testing. Uh, they still make the speakers pay for the travels, but previously they had no speakers dinner. Now they do. Mm. Previously, you know, like like there were, were a lot of kind of like other benefits that they were also missing. So So they've been doing a lot of work in trying to make it somewhat better. But I think uh, there's still more to do on the the uh, well the money out of pocket that a speaker must have uh, so that they can they can show up because again it also it's a it's a note in our professional kind of like a listing of things we have accomplished that we've been there and I would hope that it was more of an uh, equal opportunity based on contents rather than than having to consider whether you were lucky enough to be in a job where you are the person your company is willing to pay to travel if you are speaking. Marit, I also would like to sort of pick your your brain here. What would you recommend to maybe to someone, to a woman who's thinking of getting into public speaking? So someone who maybe has one or two conferences under their belt, how would you recommend they approach public speaking in general? Uh, that they would look at uh, the travel. Well, first of all, find places that don't make you pay your own travel. That's a, a, a good way of selecting conferences. There's plenty of those opportunities. So kind of like pick the ones that have already gotten over this, this, this threshold. But then the other part is kind of like, you know, you can choose your locations based on, on places you would want to go to. Mm-hmm. Conference speaking has taken me to 28 countries. So I used to collect countries uh, through conference speaking. It is, you know, like using your personal motivations as, as part of it is, is also a, a relevant place. But um, I think the most relevant benefit of the thing that you want to look for is the other speakers who will show up on the same space where you will end up traveling in Uh, because uh, the speakers community kind of like the other speakers what you can learn from them 
that will grow you professionally a lot. So going to places where they will speak your language, first of all, that there's a shared possibility of, of uh, not ending up in, uh, well, I, I've been to a lot of places where uh, they speak English to, to me, but in, in any other conversations, it's, it's not English at all. Yeah. And I have had lovely sessions with Brick, Richard Bradshaw in some of those conferences where, you know, he speak the only one who speaks to me then because, you know, we both are language limited uh, when, when the local language is something mid-European. Uh, mid so, so choosing places where kind of the code of conduct already encourages use of English as the primary language of the conference, they pay for speaking and, and uh, being very selfish about your own priorities of what do you want out of this? If travel is what you want, go to Hawaii. That was my very first conference in oh, Hawaii. Wow. So uh, definitely there for the location, not for the conference. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm so bummed that <laughs> we've reached the one hour. Yeah. I feel like I want to talk more. Um, but perhaps, um, Marit, like, because I don't want to, like, start talking about, you know, exploratory testing because we don't have a lot of time. But it would be really amazing again if you know we can have you um you know like as a guest i know that you've quit <laughs> public speaking but hopefully this is just more of like a natural conversation um and it's it's just been amazing to hear you know your stories like your vulnerability um and thank you so much yeah for all the contributions uh, that you have done to the community it's been a lovely conversation thank you ladies awesome well, thank you so much. Um, this is it for today's episode. Um, next week, I think we are back again, Nicole. We'll, we'll, yes, we'll, we are. We'll get that confirmed. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I hope you enjoyed uh, today's episode and it gave you a lot of insights into the whole world <laughs> of uh, public speaking. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, for now, uh, we're off and I hope you all have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.